Well, it's it's either we might have to upgrade computers or we might have to upgrade operators. So, <laughs> which one's cheaper? <laughs> Mike, if you didn't hear that, Mike said, which one's cheaper? I, I'm not going to get into that at all. So I hope you got an outline this morning. If you didn't, I'll try to do my best to present it. That's my job anyway, right? That's what I'm supposed to be able to do, so maybe I can do it. Um, Oddly enough, I got the computer back up and running, but the little mouse pad is non-functional, so uh, I I don't know. I don't know what's going on, so we'll we'll figure it out. Um, Overworked and underpaid, and so it's rebelling, right? We have been studying the work of the church uh, as we read it in the scriptures and uh, have covered a number of uh, the works, if you will. We began in Ephesians 4 looking at the purpose of the offices that have been given within the church and the work of the church to minister to the saints for the edifying of the body so that we can all come to the unity of the knowledge and love of Christ as, as we read there. And it's that equipping of the saints and that work of ministry, that edifying uh, and the edifying of ourselves as the body of Christ that's the ultimate goal of all of this. And we've looked at having assemblies, observing the Lord's Supper, singing praise to God and edifying one another in song. Uh, we've looked at praying with one another and for one another, preaching and teaching God's Word. And this morning we're to talk about taking up a monetary collection, the collection for the saints. As was read to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, it comes to a point in time when Paul is talking about uh, a collection, a specific collection, an effort that was made in order to give to, to see to the need of needy saints in Jerusalem, primarily. And this really goes back uh, to the day of Pentecost, as we read in Acts chapter 2, when you had some 3,000 souls that were baptized and that became a part of the church, the Lord added them to the church. And then we read as you keep going on past verses 38, 39, and 40 that they had all things in common and that they were sharing with their goods with one another as they had need. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved in verse 47. And it, it, we see kind of early on that there were needs. And remember, that first group of Christians there in Jerusalem were made up in a large part of people who had traveled from all over the place, Jews who had traveled to come to Jerusalem to observe Pentecost. And it seems that as they became now Christians, they just stayed in Jerusalem. So they were, they were truly pilgrims, you know. Vagabonds, you know, they they had set up shop now because of the church just being in that one place. And as you read through the book of Acts, you even find that then possessions were sold. We, we were introduced to Barnabas in part of that, right? Where their, their land and possessions were sold to keep seeing to this need. Even became a point of controversy of them needing to feed uh, the widows and the ones that were in need of food. And so the, the, the apostles appointed uh, those who could be special servants to see to that need so they could keep preaching and teaching and praying and not wait on tables as they talked about it. And I just remind us of some of those things in that this is something that was seen very early on is that there were those who were needy among the saints and there... They didn't just preach and teach the gospel message and forget to take care of those physical needs. Those were things that were being addressed in the midst of the laboring in the Word of God too. They were laboring to also take care of needy people. There are some that have said from a biblical scholarly standpoint that maybe the church in Jerusalem caused some of their own neediness by almost practicing a sense of communism, you know, by sharing all these things with one another. And there's been uh, maybe a lot of political talk in our day and time about communism too because of things that have happened in our politics and world. And I don't know that that is the case. I don't know that we really have any full indication of it. But there is a, a reality that no matter how we try to take care of needs, throughout all of mankind's history, 
there have been those who were impoverished, those who were poor. There's always been the need to take care of the poor. As a matter of fact, when you go back to the Old Testament, I'm not going to spend time, too much time on it here this morning. I, I would encourage you to come maybe be with us this evening. And in our study time of this, I would like to delve into it. But in Deuteronomy 15, the command is given in the Old Testament on how to deal with those who are poor. And it states that the poor will never cease. You're always going to have poor. Jesus even said the same thing in Matthew 11, or excuse me, Matthew 26, that the poor you have with you always, he says. Remember the woman who came and anointed him, and the question was raised by the disciples, why was this wasted? Why was this precious oil wasted? It could have been sold, and, and the pro, from the proceeds we could have helped the poor. And Jesus said, the poor you have with you always, but me, he said, you, you will not have with you always. But it's an interesting statement that the poor will have with us always. In America, we're very blessed that poverty is not what real poverty is in many cases throughout the rest of the world. I've not had the, the, the honor, privilege, or experience of traveling to uh, countries that are truly impoverished. But I know maybe some of you have, and I know of some who have and have heard their stories and when you hear the stories of what real poverty is, then it really is embarrassing to even think about the way that we live. We are so blessed. We are so blessed. So I, I mention all those things in introduction today because I really think it's hard for you and I to truly appreciate the idea of seeing to the needs of the poor. Because I dare say that not many of us know anybody that's really, really, really poor. We know people probably who are in the poverty category as our country states it. And there are needs. And there are needs beyond the poverty level at times among all of us. But could I ask us this morning for a moment to keep our view on the poor in perspective? And to first and foremost give thanks to God for the blessings that we enjoy? Because we are so richly blessed. So richly blessed. Now having said all that, in, in 2 Corinthians 8, as, as he talks about the brethren being involved in this giving. I want to note just a few things quickly about this and then jump to our main text for today. But in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. So he's writing to the church at Corinth about things that have been done in Macedonia. And I also alluded to then there were things that have been done in Jerusalem, seeing to the needy saints. And he, noted, he says in verse 2 that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. So these churches in Macedonia, even though they were under trial, under affliction, and in some ways impoverished themselves, they found a way to show an abundance of giving. Verse 3, for I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, so he establishes kind of a baseline here. He, they gave according to their ability and beyond their ability. They were freely willing. They were willing to give. Verse 4, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. One of the things that's interesting, too, and it's also been a point of controversy through the years, is that when you read about giving in the New Testament, it's very closely related with fellowship. And that's stated right here in this statement. That they were in this for the giving of this gift and the fellowship of ministering it to the saints. In other words, they're joining together. It's a joint effort here. That even though the gift is coming from one place and going all the way to another, it is seen as a tie that binds the two places and the two groups of saints. And so he goes on and he says in verse 5, Not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord. Now this didn't take the place of their faith, their worship, their practicing of everything else they were to do as Christians. 
But it says, and then they gave to us by the will of God. They put God first, but then they wholeheartedly gave themselves to this opportunity as well. Verse 6, he says, So we urge Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. Titus had been the messenger and the carrier of the gift, the monetary gift, back and forth. Verse 7, But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. So Paul is telling the church at Corinth, the churches in Macedonia embraced this. And they gave generously. And they gave beyond their ability. And they first gave themselves to the Lord. They didn't, this wasn't something that was buying their way into the kingdom of God or buying their way into the good graces of God. No, they first had given themselves fully to the Lord. And now they are also giving for this need. And they see it as helping via fellowship to minister to these saints. And then Paul said to Corinth, now I want you to do the same thing. I want you to do the same thing. Now if he's saying that to Corinth, what do you think he'd say to Sandlin Road? Ditto, right? <laughs> I really believe he would. I think that's the point of us being able to look at these scriptures and learn from the examples and the commands and the teachings that are given here is that we can learn to say, you know what, this is an example worth following. This is something we also should do. So to that point, I want us to go back to what he first wrote to Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. In the 1 Corinthian letter, he's dealing with a lot of problems, issues, questions, some really heavy-hitting stuff when you get down to it. But at the end of the letter in 1 Corinthians 16, he deals with the collection for the saints. Might note that we lose some of this because of the breaking up of things by book, chapter, and verse. But in chapter 15, he is talking about our final victory. He's talking about being resurrected like Christ. And he kind of has come to this great climax of all this uh, wonderful thought. As he, he says in verse 51, I tell you a mystery. We should not all sleep, but we should all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. But the trumpet will sound, the dead, and cry, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. He's, he's got all this momentum. You can just almost hear him just, you know, pounding the pulpit and shouting and preaching. And then in verse 58, verse 57, God gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And then he says, now, concerning the collection for the saints. <laughs> it is kind of a strange transition, isn't it? But does it lessen the importance of it at all? No. Matter of fact, in, in some ways, I would submit that it heightens the importance of it. That coming on the heels of what he just said about looking forward to that resurrection day. He doesn't just end there and say, you know what, man, that was it. <laughs> I nailed it. No, I don't know why he put the rest of this where he put it, but through the Corinthian letter, he seems to be dealing with certain questions and things that needed to be addressed. This clearly was one of those things that needed to be addressed. And, and, and in some ways we could say it was almost like, well, before I forget, let's deal with this. Well, I don't, maybe not. That now is, is, it could be an emphatic kind of statement. Now, now concerning the collection for the saints. Now that I have your attention... <laughs> you know, it might be another way of saying it. Now that I have your attention. Now, let's not just think about the resurrection because we've got to deal with the here and now too. And the here and now is very much 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 and 2. So I kind of like that now because you can kinda, we can kind of play on that a number of ways. Now, I got your attention. Now, let's deal with the here and now. Now, let's not forget what we've got to deal with here in this moment. The Thessalonian brethren seem to have been almost those who just wanted to kind of sit around and wait for the coming of Christ. And so what did Paul teach them about? He taught them about going on and working and feeding yourself and feeding your family 
taking care of those things that are the here and now, even though we're waiting on the coming of the Lord. And so this kind of fits the same thing. Now, concerning the collection for the saints. So let's, let's read verses 1 and 2 all together. He says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Going on then in verse 3 and 4, he finishes this really by saying, And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. That's kind of the administering part of it. I really want us to focus on verses 1 and 2 and each of the phrases that we see there because each of them teach us something. First of all, he says, Now concerning the collection. Well, that, that right there in of itself answers one of the questions we're dealing with in this series. What is the local church to do according to the Scriptures? Well, there's to be a collection. I mean, we, can, we see that right here, right? And, and jumping a little ahead, he says, as he commanded the churches in Galatia, so you must also do. So just like in 2 Corinthians 8, he gives them the example of what the churches in Macedonia did, and then he tells them, now I want you to do the same. He's saying the same thing here. as Just the same as I have commanded, ordered, instructed the churches of Galatia, so now I'm telling you the same thing. So what would he say to Sandlin Road? <laughs> say the same thing, right? So first of all, there's a collection. Now, during our coronavirus times, this has kind of all been, you know, changed and thrown in upheaval to some degree. And I want to, first of all, commend uh, the brethren here at Sandlin Road, because uh, the elders can correct me if I'm wrong, but we have maintained having a collection one way or another through all of this. And I think all the brethren are being commended in that. Because I know that many churches have struggled to figure out just how to do that and how to get it here and there and, you know, whatever. But bottom line is, a collection has been maintained through all that, and that should be the case. So there is to be a collection. Now, that brings up a whole lot of things right there. Because if we are going to have a collection of money, then there's got to be responsibility for that. There's got to be security of that. There's got to be an accounting of that. There's got to be plans for that. There's got to be transparency with that. There's got to be the use of that. You know, one of the things that's been eye-opening to me is, you know, we're, we're a relatively small congregation here in a rural area. I just want you to kind of, for a moment, can you pick yourself up and beam me up, Scotty, and transport yourself to somewhere else for a minute? And can you imagine sitting in a, a much larger congregation? Let's just even think about the church in Jerusalem. Let's just go back to the church in Jerusalem. And they had 3,000 souls, right, on that first day. And they were constantly adding. So I don't know, let's just say there was between three and 4,000 people. And if they passed our trays around... That wouldn't work, would it? No, they'd have had to have, you know, like baskets, buckets, bags. I don't know. But can you imagine if 3,000 people, gave, if they just gave in the same way that you and I generally would from week to week, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that's a lot more money than what we would be dealing with on a week-to-week -week basis. And so then our elders probably are much more keen to this than any of us because they deal with these things. But then think about the pressure in a sense and the responsibility placed on them because now we have 30 times the money and we've got to find the scriptural, biblical, appropriate way to use those funds. It's a big responsibility. And maybe in a smaller congregation we can lose sight of some of those things, but that's a real reality and a challenge for many elders in the Lord's church, especially when you have a large gathering of people because now you have a large amount of funds. It, there is legitimately a collection. And it's, it needs to be dealt with and used appropriately. Secondly, notice, he says, Now concerning the collection for the saints. For the saints. This is a really important thing because throughout the New Testament when we read about what the collective church gathered in this collection, 
we always read about it being used somehow for the saints. Now, we'll probably talk a little more about this tonight in some detail, and I would encourage you to study on that, but that in and of itself puts a certain parameter on it, that it's for the saints, so it's for Christians. So it's not just for anything. You with me there? It's not for just anything. It's for the saints. Notice he also says, as I've given orders to the churches of Galatia. So somebody might say, well, he was talking specifically here to Corinth. No, he's saying this is something that he's teaching to all the churches. So what would he say to Sandlin Road? <laughs> I think he would say the same thing. So here's the collection for the saints that should be practiced among all the churches. So you must also do... This is, again, where sometimes we talk about command and example and necessary inference. You know, and even sometimes when we're talking about all those things, it still gets a little bit gray and hard to you know, figure out exactly what we're supposed to do. But I would submit to you that 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 has absolutely no gray area to it. There is to be a collection for the saints... And this is to be in all the churches. He's making it very clear what he's saying here. You must do this. You must do this. He even makes it clear when it's to be done. Verse 2, the very first statement. On the first day of the week. This is another, even though he's not dealing with singing and praying and partaking the Lord's Supper, he's not dealing with those particular elements of worship. He is still dealing with something that the church is to do. The church is in Galatia, the church at Corinth. If we could pull in the 2 Corinthians 8 example, the church is in Macedonia. So when were the churches getting together to do things? <laughs> On the first day of the week. On the first day of the week. And this brings up a few questions, and we might want to discuss this more tonight. I'm just going to kind of tease it here. But, you know, we all get, we probably all get paid in somewhat different ways. Some people get paid weekly. Some people get paid bi-weekly. Some people get paid monthly. You know, th things, things are different there. So then the way you set up your personal budget is probably dictated by that to some degree. So some things, if you're paid weekly, maybe you, you almost work on a weekly type budget more so. But if you're paid bi-weekly, then maybe you're more thinking monthly-ish, you know. And if you're paid monthly, you're definitely thinking monthly, you know. So then the question comes, well, when do, I, when do I give and how much do I decide? You know, that's kind of the big question. Well, he's going to deal with that here a little bit in this text. We'll deal with it more in some other texts, Lord willing, tonight. But when was the church to take the collection? On the first day of the week. That's made very clear. Okay? So then he says, let each one of you lay something aside. Let each one of you. So who's to do this? Everybody. Every Christian. Every member of the body of Christ at Corinth is who he's talking to here. So what would he say to Galatia? Obviously, it said the same thing. What would he say to us? Let each one of you. And he says, lay something aside. So in that, he answers the question of, well, how much? Well, he really doesn't say in this text. But he says something. Something. Lay something aside. He gives it a little bit of definition in saying, storing up as he may prosper. Which, that's kind of the no-brainer. That if, I, if I'm going to get paid weekly, then I need enough money to cover my bills and expenses and everything else. But somewhere in all of that, I need to understand that God has also commanded me through these apostles and this scripture to lay something aside for the church's collection. Now, I don't think it would be real beneficial to see that as a bill coming due every week. 
but it has that kind of significance, or should. It needs to have a definite placement based on what he's saying here, that each one lays something aside as he may prosper. You've got to view it within what you are able to do and what you plan to do with your money. He finally there says that there be no collections when I come. You know, if somebody came in today and let us know that there was a great need and we had not been taking up collections, then, you know, I, I, I for one hardly ever carry cash. You know, these, these little plastic cards, you know, y'all know what they are, right? These little, these little debit cards, I mean, it kind of in some ways makes cash irrelevant, you know? But that's not real conducive if somebody just has a sudden need, is it? It's getting a little easier now with Venmo and PayPal and, you know, stuff like that. Or you can just send money to one another. But if somebody came to us with an immediate urgent need and we had not taken any collections, then that would be a great financial strain and it would be tough and it might be impossible to really even do something effective for the need. So do you see the wisdom of what Paul is saying? Do you see the wisdom of what God's plan for the church is? That we take up these weekly collections so there is a collection and there are funds available to meet the needs. Because the needs will come. Because the poor will have with us always. Because trials and tribulations will come. Time and chance, as the proverbial writer says, happens to us all. These things happen and they will present opportunities for such to be used. So I, I want to make a I want to make a closing plea to you this morning, and I again I really would hope you'd come back tonight because there's much more to talk about this. But but seeing just this text is the beginning of it. It establishes what the church is to do, which is what we've been trying to mainly do in these lessons is establish that. Well, what is the church to do according to the scriptures? And the church clearly is to take up a collection on the first day of the week. So I want to ask you this. Do you, as a child of God, participate in giving to that collection with all of your heart as much as you would singing, or praying, or participating in Bible class? I hope you do, and I'm not trying to cast a stone, I'm just wanting to make us all think, and I need to think about it too. And what I would encourage us to do is to not let dropping money into that plate become just an automatic, hey, I always do this. Let me ask you this. When's the last time that you really sat down and thought about why you give how much you give? Was it a year ago? Was it five years ago? Was it 20 years ago? Why do you give how much you give? Do you do that because that's what your parents did? Do you do that because it's just what's left at the end of the week? You know, there's a lot of questions that should come up upon us as individuals. It should come to us naturally, in a sense, to think about this. When we see that the local church is to have a collection on the first day of the week, and each one of us is to participate, then all these questions should come to our mind. And many of them, regardless of what anything else the Scripture says, many of them could be answered by good consciences in good ways. And that is that I need to be an active participant in that giving. I need to be truly laying up as I may prosper. And I need to be thinking about it in those terms from a sincere heart. Now, it's not real becoming of preachers to talk about giving, right? I'm just going to say that out loud to say to you that it really shouldn't matter. I am so humbly grateful for what you all pay me to do what I do here. I'm not looking for a raise today. But 
But what I'm looking for is for us to do what the church is to do. And I hope you would be too. I would love to see us better give as individuals to the point where these elders here have to be meeting to say, men, what do we do? We can't just bankroll this. What do we do? That would be exciting. That would be exciting. So let's take an honest look. Let's give honest accounting of what we're doing and be good stewards of what God has given us. And let's give God the first fruits. Let's plan and prepare and make a point to do it. Not to give the preacher a raise, but to give God what he is owed, what he is due, and what he needs so that the needs of the poor, the needs of the saints, the work of the church can be done in such a way that we're always asking, what more can we do? Instead of having this like false ceiling on ourselves of this is all we can do. No, what more can we do? What more can we do? Well, certainly this has not been a lesson to try to bring you to obedience to Christ, but wouldn't you consider it today? 1 Corinthians 15 talks about that great resurrection, the victory that is in Christ Jesus. None of this other stuff will matter. You know, our, our money is all going to perish with us one day. But your soul, your soul will go on for eternity, either in heaven, everlasting life, or in hell, ever, everlasting punishment. Which way are you going today? Only you know. And if you dare feel like today you're headed toward the way of everlasting punishment, please don't leave this place without trying to do something to change that. Let's change that. That's what repentance is all about. Making a change. So let's change that path. And for those who are on the path toward heaven, great. Let's continue in it. Thanks be to God that He's shown us the way. But if there's something you need to do today to get on the right path, let's do it. We'll pray with you, pray for you, study with you, help you, whatever it is we can do, or baptize you into Christ. That's what Jesus said. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. If you haven't been baptized into Christ, there's your answer. That's what you need to do today to get on the right path. If we could help you, won't you come while we stand and sing?